hello everyone i'm hoping that by now david everyone is uh, uh, is on board i see that they are in listen only mode um i propose that we start uh, hello everyone this is uh, welcome to the digital clinic uh, webinar hosted by j, j europe and avanad and this is part of the digital innovation award that we will be giving to the best teams at the uh, j europe enterprise challenge in oslo my name is diana philip and i'm speaking on behalf of j europe and i'm here to to thank uh, avanad for doing this uh, uh, series of webinar this is the third of them uh, we had two others one was dedicated to ai and big data and another one on on design thinking so this one is a digital clinic probably many of you will be asking what is that and I will let Matt answer that later on uh, but uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit more about uh, the event in Oslo and I assume that everyone who's attending here are part of the 15 teams that are representing their national uh, uh, organization at the uh, enterprise challenge in Oslo I assume that all, not, not all of them are will be able to join for for the reason why we recorded the webinar to make it available to everyone who's not made may who was not able to make it for today so this will be recorded and will be provided to everyone afterwards uh, so as you probably have seen on the website and you know if you come to oslo you have the opportunity to compete for different prizes one of them will be the digital innovation award and the award will recognize the best team who showcase a digitally innovative mindset as they conceive their business idea or concept and the teams will be judged by senior leaders from avanad who will assess each business in terms of viability feasibility, sustainability, digital ethics, and team presentation and soft skills. But I will let Tina Senior from Avana tell you more about the Digital Innovation Award criteria in just a bit. And I'm also pleased to tell you that one of the speakers with us today is Matt Joe, who is the Chief Technology Innovation Officer at Avana in Seattle. Thank you so much, Matt, for, for uh, joining the call. You are also a jury member in Oslo. So uh, even a more special moment for for the team to to hear your presentation and your intervention but i think we will come to you after after tina is giving us a little bit of an overview on the avana digital innovation award and why you are doing this tina can you hear us absolutely yes i can um i'll get started so yeah welcome to this webinar um this as, as diana has said this is for those of you um, who are particularly interested in digital innovation and the Avanard Digital Innovation Award. And just want to say a couple of things here and then just dive into the criteria and then we'll get to um, get to you and ask and answering your questions. But really just wanted to say you know, this award is recognizing those teams who really have built digital innovation into their business plans. So rather than just sort of thinking of it as something, oh, we've got a business idea and running through everything, and then at the end, oh, how can we add on digital innovation? We're really looking for teams who have you know, built their concept, built their plans around digital innovation, you know, maybe looking for that gap in the market that, that can be filled with, um, you know, with a, a digital business, et cetera. So it's really, you know, we're looking for um, the, the business plan that, that has digital as you know, part of its, as, of its skeleton. Um, we have some great judges this year. We have Matt Joe, who's on the call today. He's Avanard's Chief Technology Officer. We have Lisa Eckenstam, who um, is a Norwegian national, so we thought it'd be nice to let her go home um, for a little while, but um, she's our European Marketing Lead and also our Program um, PMO Program Management Officer for Technology for Social Good, which is Avanard's business focus on the nonprofit sector. Uh, we also have Jens Bo Nielsen, who is our general manager for the Nordics, and Heba Ramsey, who is our global corporate citizenship lead. So some, some great judges. And then just very quickly, some great prizes. There's a cash prize of a thousand euros, um, which is yours to you know, split amongst the team and spend as you wish. We hope you'll use it to further your education or put it towards furthering your education. 
Um, but then it really, you know, the main prize is, we believe, the opportunity to meet and engage with some of our senior team. So we'll bring the winning team to London. You can meet um, Darren Hardman, who is our European um, regional lead and his top team. And also we're going to, if you would like, we're going to give you the opportunity to have one to one mentoring and coaching from an Avenard executive. And just you know, working across the corporate citizenship program as I do and with some of our scholars in our scholarship program who receive mentoring, um, you know, they tell us that this has been invaluable to their career development, just having that one to one time with somebody who's you know, trodden the path that they would they would like to tread. So you know, we, we hope that that's an enticing um, prize. So I wonder, Diane, could you move on to, or David, um, could you move on to the next slide for me? And I'm just going to take a couple of minutes um, to run through the award criteria. Just so to confirm the slides is there. Ah, oh, wonderful. Thank you, Diane. So we have um, the same four criteria that we had last year, but we've added a bonus one this year around digital ethics, but I'll come to that in a second. And these are weighted in terms of importance, but they're all very important. So uh, you know, I hope that as teams you're thinking about each of these. So 45% of the marks um, is around your use of digital innovation. And this really harks back to what I said on the, the previous slide. We're looking for that team that have really been creative and innovative with their use of technology, whether their business is designed around a technology or, or if they've used it to create a more innovative user experience, that we're really looking to see you know, a business that is a digital business. So that's that's why that's such a large percentage of the marks. But then equally important, 30% of the marks is viability and feasibility. So, you know, you could have this great idea, but if, if it doesn't have legs, as we say, if it's not, um, hasn't been thought through, if it isn't realistic, if it isn't, isn't practical, if you haven't thought about you know, your different, um, you know, your, your distribution channels or your partners in the ecosystem in which you're going to, to operate, um, then it, you know, it's, it's going to be less viable. So we're really looking and you know, putting some strong marks around how are you structuring your company? What is What does your business case look like? Then smaller marks, but you know, again, very important business sustainability. I think there are two things here. One is the business itself. How sustainable is your business? Again, is it, you know, is it a pop-up Christmas shop, which has only got a very short season, or is it something that's really going to address a gap in the market for the longer term? Or is it something that you can build upon? Is it something that's very agile that you can adapt as the market moves, as invariably it does? So the sustainability in that sense, plus your team, you know, do you have a strong team? Are you, you know, do you have a succession plan? Are you looking to recruit some top people? So that's part of sustainability, but also I think there'd be extra marks there if you've thought about your sustainability agenda, so your energy usage, your carbon footprint, is your business circular? Can you reuse, remake, re-engineer, et cetera? So I think the extra, extra points there. And then 10% of the marks, and again, this is the bit that sometimes people can have a fabulous plan, great ideas, but then they kind of fall down at the end on the presentation and, and soft skills. Always called soft skills, but as a communicator, I think, <laughs> I think we should think of a new name, but it's, this is really the team and how you present. Are you compelling? Have you thought of a creative way to, to share your business idea with the judges? Have you worked well together? Is, is, your, you know, is it an effective team? Are you communicating well? So 10% of the marks go for all of those, those soft skills, but really it's only 10%, but it can, it can really make the difference in how you communicate all of those other criteria. And then finally, um, five bonus points for teams that are looking at digital ethics. So really, you know, there are a number of principles. Have you thought about the security um, of your of the information that you're holding um, and the privacy? Obviously, if, if we are based in Europe, so GDPR um, is incredibly important. Um, and also, have you built a methodology around what we're calling here digital ethics by design? So it's really looking to see that you're incorporating this latest, well, a, a latest thinking, but also these really important policy points um, into, into your business. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hand back to Diane, and then we can get underway with the important bits. And if I drop off for a second, Diane, I'm just going to rejoin, because I would love to see the presentation as well. I don't know what I've done with it. So Sure. Thank you so, so much, Tina. 
uh, I will be there. <laughs> perfect uh, and and all the information is available on our website as long as uh, uh, you will be able to see a video from the last year edition with the winners there so please do go and visit the website to be well familiar with the work criteria before you come to Oslo um, now I will go to Matt to try to to, to, to have the digital clinic and Matt maybe I will ask you first to start to explain a little bit how do you see this digital clinic and how do you see this working because I know we have a couple of questions that were raised in the previous webinars that uh, uh, would be good to answer today mm -hmm. but maybe you already have some other other thoughts you want to start with sure absolutely so um Hi everyone, it's an honor to be here and talking with you and I appreciate you attending the previous webinars. Um, I'm sure they explained a little more about who Avanade is, but uh, just so I get that done as well. Um, we are the leading digital innovator in the Microsoft ecosystem, providing digital uh, business solutions and managed services. And um, another way to look at us, another angle I suppose, is that we are a joint venture between Accenture and Microsoft. We operate in over 20 countries, um, kind of float around 35,000 employees. So uh, you can think of us as the technology services provider, platform provider for um, the, some of the largest companies in the world um, and also some of the smaller ones in the regional uh, space. And we really help our clients uh, really achieve innovation um, and the art of the possible with regard to, to their investments in the Microsoft ecosystem. And when we say Microsoft ecosystem, that goes beyond just Microsoft products, um, but it also uh, integrates with the, ser the services and devices that the platform enables and integrates with as well, which is fairly broad. As we know now that you know platforms like Office 365 and so Outlook or whatever else you want to call it uh, operate on iOS devices and Android devices and those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think Tina did a fantastic job setting up the challenge. What I wanted to do though, um, was kind of just set some context, having participated in the uh, the event last year as well, and there is there has definitely been a pretty massive realization over the last let's say 10 to 20 years that essentially every business is becoming a technology business. Uh, so you can have a fantastic human centered, uh, human centric uh, idea, but at some point, in order to express the true scale and potential and link people and cultures and businesses together, eventually you're going to have to um, apply technology. And I think that's what we're really trying to get young entrepreneurs to understand is that um, if you are not prepared for that, if you don't know how to leverage that, you most likely will not succeed in your business model or business plan, not because it wasn't a great business model or business plan, but because it didn't really reach its potential, because it didn't eventually um, become a digital business. And the other thing that um, you know Tina was getting at as well is that it's not only about that; it's about making sure that you're doing that ethically. And you know, there there are we reference the the ethics framework, and you can find that online in pictures and diagrams of circles and really what that means. But um, again, oftentimes when I deal with startups and, and I mentor young companies as well is that they, they start to go down the dangerous path of, well, I can do this with the technology, which absolutely you can. You can absolutely personalize your website, the application, your business product or whatever. But there is a fine line between being on the cool side of things and crossing that line and becoming creepy. Um, and so uh, just because you can, should you, right? And I think that those are the kinds of things that that business owners uh, need to be aware of as they're looking at the requirements, as they're looking to engage their customers, as they're looking to engage their partners. Um, you have to treat, you know, the people's privacy very, 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 very um, separately. And also on the security side, privacy does not equal security. And it's also important to know how you treat that data as well. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, I think what we're, what we're trying to see and trying to help um, the young entrepreneurs think about is really how they're going to navigate that world. How best are they going to uh, take advantage of essentially a blended workforce? And this is something I talk about to our clients all the time. The blended workforce is really a combination of not only humans, but it's also intelligent systems. So things like AI or robotic process automation, which basically is just automated processes based on you know a workflow um, and things. 
so devices, sensors, robots. And so what we're finding is, um, you know, the, the, the notion of an HR department and managing talent is changing. When people understand that the talent in the room is both the people and the actual physical room, and the notion that people, the system, the building is alive and aware, and you know who's in the room, and you know when they've left the room, and you know the energy use of the room, and you might know the content, um, you know, being presented on the screens and those kinds of things, that there's plenty of potential to do some amazing and disruptive things. But unless you view all of those systems as a blended piece of talent, and then, you know, knowing the kind of talent that needs to manage the talent, you know, I live in Seattle, and this is the home base of Amazon. And, you know, oftentimes people talk about their warehouses and uh, the, the fact that the roles of the, the people in the warehouses, the humans in the warehouses is changing. It's not necessarily that jobs are going away. It's just that the roles and the responsibilities and the things that the humans will do when there are now robots in the warehouse is going to be different. Uh, you can literally find robot managers, you know, the job openings for those roles open online, which is something that you probably didn't see very much of um, about a decade ago. You might have seen that in things like the automotive industry, but not necessarily in the Walmart warehouse or the Boots Walgreens warehouse or something like that. So anyway, what I was invited to do today um, was to answer some of your questions that um, came up previously in the other webinars, and then um, definitely open to to uh, answering some of your questions or maybe possibly vetting some of your ideas or where you think your solutions are going or your businesses are going. Uh, and we have plenty of time. And if we end early, we end early. But um, yeah, that's, that's, what, um, that's what I'm here for. That's great. Thank you so much, Matt, for this introduction. And I know that we already have some very practical questions because these are uh, young startups and, of course, they want to know what something works for their business. So one of the questions was in the area of AI and big data, and mm -hmm. they were asking if you have experience with WordPress and are there ways to create unique users' experience on such a web page using AI? Yeah. So WordPress is a fantastic web content management system. Um, it is very, very popular out there uh, for a variety of reasons, be it price, availability, ease of use, those kinds of things. Um, so WordPress, the architecture of WordPress is actually a plugin architecture, meaning that you can go to a marketplace. I don't, I don't quite know if it, they call it a marketplace, but you can go to an app store essentially or a marketplace or a plugin store and purchase or download free modules that you can plug into your WordPress site. Um, personalization has a number of angles. Uh, you can do it just from a pure what we call A-B testing, where you might have seen this as a consumer, where you go to a web page and it looks one way and you hit F5 or refresh and it looks like something else. Um, and it's not necessarily tailored to you, it's just like flipping content. Oftentimes that's called an A-B test and it's changing the user experience or the information architecture on the page, trying to test which user interface works for the audience. Um, that's one way to essentially change content dynamically, not necessarily personalization. The other way you start to get more into a more formal content management system and CRM system, so customer relationship management system. In those ones, you'll you'll find that the prices of those, as they get better and better at essentially digital marketing or um, really targeted marketing for an actual individual, um, those those get very expensive over time. You can imagine, or in some cases, they, people don't buy them anymore and they invest millions of dollars in building their own. Um, you can think of that as Amazon.com, or you can think of that as Netflix or Spotify or some of these other ones. These are not necessarily off-the-shelf products, and they're definitely not using WordPress. Um, but anyway, so if you wanted to use WordPress in your solution, you can go to their plugin or their marketplace and look at a number of essentially CRM systems uh, where you have a record that my name's Matt, Matt is a customer, Matt has bought these things before, Matt lives in this region, <clears throat> Matt tends to shop at these times a day, Matt tends to like these kinds of products, Matt has returned these products so many times, that's how much data you could actually store and much, much, much more. Matt has two kids, you know, Matt has these cars. Uh, you know, you can go very, very far with it. On the flip side, um, if you wanted to do that anonymously, that's essentially where you run into cookies and ad networks. Um, and cookies, and I'm not gonna share all the personalization, we don't have enough time for that, honestly, but um, cookies are where you 
track people's usage and you've said on your websites especially in europe you have a little pop-up that says our site uses cookies what that's doing is it's actually tracking you um and as you come back to the website it knows that you've been there before it knows that you can store data there it's a very temporary thing you can remove them in your browser and start again fresh um but oftentimes people don't realize that and that's because you know, it's for, there's a reason for that because the companies want to know more about you and as they have a network or affiliate network let's say they have a partner company or brand that car, that partner brand if they're given rights can read that cookie as well so this is for example if you've ever shopped on adidas uh, adidas.com you see one shoe and then all of a sudden every website you go to you see an ad for that shoe well, it's because they're, they're they're bought into that ad network um, and a cookie is telling that module on the website to show you that shoe that you maybe put into your cart or they want you to go buy. Um, so anyway, so like I said, there's A-B testing, there is uh, there are cookies, there are formal um, CRM systems that, again, for those ones in particular, you're most likely going to have an account login. Uh, and again, some of those plugins support that. Uh, but those are some of the key ones. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful. That's great. Well, I think you used the example of Adidas and they were asking about Netflix. So it really answered answered oh, okay. everything there. So per perfect. Uh, the other questions that I have here uh, was linked with uh, predictive data. Is, hmm. it, so it reads like, is predicted data really feasible for startups given the current technology and the amount of data needed to be processed for occur accuracy? Yeah, so I mean, this is this is a broad question because yeah. pre predictive data, um, you know, some of it's very pattern based. Uh, people work Monday to Friday. You know, you most likely don't want to engage someone on a Friday afternoon. So that's just sort of a workflow thing. So there's there are certain patterns that you can code off of, and you can kind of predict essentially the the statistical feasibility or model or um, you know the probability that's probably the better word of something happening most predictions are essentially just probability meaning that it, we the probability of this happening is 80 percent so we're going to do something we're going to take action on it um, there's no necessarily 100 percent accurate predictive model um, but the probability model is really what drives the accuracy so if you're looking at your own data, um, most likely you don't have enough data to make a prediction unless you have a very known action and data set and um, a very good essentially model uh, that you've codified that you could repeat. Um, as you get bigger, uh, you tend to use a model that uses other data as well. So um, for example, farming. It's not just about having the right seed and having the watering system in place and the right tractor. Um, you also might need weather data, um, for example, to know that your sprinkler system should not sprinkle the water on at this time because it's going to be a rainstorm. Um, and so th there's a level of prediction there as well to essentially uh, improve yield in farming and agriculture. Um, for younger companies, it depends on really with the outcome that you're trying to achieve and the, the the result that you're trying to predict or codify or take action on. Um, what a lot of people don't know though is that there are plenty of models out there that you can purchase and they already have scrubbed data in them that's helped train them. And I think that's the other aspect of models that um, technology companies or even every line of business at this point are running into is that it's once you have enough data or you have enough, the algorithm is predictive enough to know that the problem, you know, to get some range of probability that seems to be consistently correct. Um, and that number doesn't have to be very high, to be honest, uh, to be effective at this point. Um, but once you have the model and you basically to decision tree based on data, um, you're not done. You, you consistently and always have to be training and tweaking that model as uh, new data bits arrive or as new um, metadata that you might want to add to the model to make it more accurate. And that's really where the, like, the notion of the role of the data scientists come in. And that's something that's um, a little new in, in the broader sense, but a very old role as well. Um, 
and the accessibility of those technologies and that that role have really um, improved. But like I said, for the younger companies, it, you know, you don't necessarily have to invest a lot. You can look at existing models and you can run your data through those models. And some of them are purchasable and installable and, you know, on software that you, that are in machines that maybe you want to own, or some can be used simply from an API or the cloud, like uh, Azure, AWS, or Google Cloud or whatever. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, like I said, it's a broad question. The answer, again, like I just shared, was pretty wide. Um, but in its simplest sense, yes, it, it can be done. It, it just depends on the price, it depends on the accuracy, and ultimately it depends on really what you're trying to do. Um, and sometimes you don't need that much data to predict. That's great. Thank you so much for that. I do have one other question that's more in the area of design, design thinking, but uh, mm -hmm. in the meantime, I also want to ask all the participants to think of questions themselves because the rest of the session will be just Q&A from their side. So they have a more, an opportunity to ask you whatever you want, they want in the area of digital innovation, just to be a bit more specific. So uh, uh, Matt, the last question here was linked with the design thinking and in the previous webinar, uh, the, the, we were discussing about the creativity, uh, the fact that uh, uh, you need to allow for design process to uh, exclude the judgment of other collaborators. And in practice, the, the, the young entrepreneur was asking that according to, to experience, is it a difficult step for managers to give up their power to open themselves to a more collective and collaborative solution? So I think you, you deal with this uh, every day in your job, so uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can explain this, how it works. Yeah, so I mean, at, at Avanade, we truly believe in design-led uh, approaches, whether that, that means design-led from a systems architecture standpoint or ultimately into a human experience, meaning that there, even that, you know, that database data, which you don't really see behind the scenes, in a lot of cases ends up being a colored pixel at some point. And that colored pixel has to drive an experience for the workplace, so for the worker or the actual customer um, of the business, or even a partner, let's say. Um, so design thinking is something that we truly believe in, and we've been on this journey for a number of years trying to get our entire organization trained up on the methods, the strategy of um, really achieving the kinds of outcomes and ideas that we think are gonna be truly disruptive for our clients. The question is actually very good though, because really what we have found is that the leadership of these companies, as in like the C-suite, CEO, the CIO, the CTO, the CDO, the CMO, the CFO, the CEO, you know, it's like so many Cs, right? So um, they are totally bought in, they get it. Now, if you go down to the actual employees, the junior employees or, the, or the, the entry level employees or the people doing the work, they totally get it. What we're finding is the middle management, the one that's been there, that has been there for 10 plus years, that is essentially a little jaded, that's a little bored <laughs> in some ways, or in some cases frustrated, they don't necessarily believe it. Um, and so what's interesting about that is design thinking is a very inclusive process. It does not, it doesn't matter if someone's more senior or more junior, it evens the playing field and says, you know, we want everyone to ask the question of what if, why not, why can't we, why shouldn't we, wouldn't it be great if, kinds of questions, how might we do something, <clears throat> and then come together and ideate, and really try to, and each method within the design thinking process is designed to achieve a certain kind of realization that you then um, expand upon, and then you, we call it flare, and then you focus back on an aspect as well. So flaring and focusing is, is a little bit of a, a process. But um, it's important to involve management in those workshops. Um, and so oftentimes you have to sell the idea and the outcomes and do little steps, take baby steps if they're really not into it. Um, you can't run the session and then simply go to management and show the outcomes and say, we believe these are the things we need to do. They need to experience that process. They need to experience the ideation. They need to experience the realizations that we're actually asking the wrong question. Meaning business, the, the business leadership wants us to um, 
That's a good example. The business leadership wants us to figure out the financial model to provide lunch for our employees every single day. It's like, okay, well, we could go do that. But after this exercise, what they really realize is the business cares about its people, wants them to be healthy, wants to reduce sick days, um, wants to provide them with good food as a, as a retention strategy and also a recruiting strategy. So really what we're trying to do is find a way to keep our employees healthy. And is lunch really the right thing to do? We don't really know. We now think that we should look at other things more broadly than just lunch to achieve the outcome of having a healthy employee base maybe to even reduce our healthcare expenses or insurance expenses. Um, so that's a kind of off the top of my head, just, and it wasn't probably 100% correct, but <laughs> the question there is, okay, are we answering the right question? Do we know the next steps? Do we know the stakeholders? Do we know the, the way this, this the, do we know the way that this can be done? What can be done early now that's tangible that can get us momentum and the confidence to keep going? And it's those kinds of outcomes that, that happen through this process. And because of that, what ends up happening is management starts to believe in it because they get clarity and buy-in from their from their staff, from other departments, because they participate as well. Uh, and then and then they know that they're they feel as a whole that they're going in the right direction. They have a clear sense of uh, what needs to get done and therefore who needs to go do it. Um, and that isn't always done through design thinking because you could actually choose the wrong methods and go through the wrong steps, but the methodology and the tool set um, and the framework essentially uh, is designed to enable that. And that's where, you know, there you can go to some sessions where the workshop was phenomenal. You can go to other sessions, honestly, where the workshop was horrible. Um, and it really does, again, it, it does rely on the talent of the people running the workshop and doing the due diligence and the research up front to, to really drive it forward. I'll just give you a sense of what how much we believe in it, you know, I'm about to drive into our corporate office where we have our global market unit leadership team. These are the people who define what we do in our business and what we take to our clients. And there's about, you know, six to eight of us. And we're going to through a two day design thinking workshop to plan what we're going to look like and our priorities for the next fiscal year. So, I mean, that's how much we use it internally and also with our clients. So hopefully that answers the question. Great, thank you. And in the meantime, I see that I'm receiving questions from uh, from the attendees. Uh, so if that's okay, uh, Matt, I'm going to read it out to you. Sure. So the question is, in your opinion, to what extent can we push digital transformation? What are the limits today and what will be the limits tomorrow? Budget, knowledge, skills, society, energy, or even human wisdom? <laughs> uh, well, they listed all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, you know, it depends on what you're actually transforming. Um, you know, you could, if you're starting today a new, a fresh, you know, you don't, you're not necessarily transformed. You might be transforming a business model or a, a service that we know today, like the taxi cabs and Uber or Lyft or, you know, whatever, or, um, you know, something as a service. And I think that's really great. Uh, I would probably say that the technology in today's world it's not really a technology problem, meaning that you could use any kind of platform, Microsoft or Amazon or just open source in general, which actually Microsoft's mostly open source as well, so you can't say that anymore, but um, you could use any kind of technology approach um, to achieve a transformed idea at scale with privacy and all that. I do think what is going to happen though is it, it, at some point it slams into the humans and the human factor is extremely interesting um, you know be it generational so how you engage your grandparents versus how you engage your children how you engage your parents the expectations and the, the digital skills of those generations is different culturally going from Poland to Atlanta Georgia um, you know from Krakow to Atlanta what does that really mean um from religious to gender to other diversity factors as well um that tends to run into acceptance and and um, usability and just you know adoption of technology but then it also runs into policy and i think this is where we've run into this with gdpr and and everything else but um 
policy, governmental policy, is going to be a massive factor. And you have a, situations now where you have CEOs of the largest technology platform companies, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Apple, whether it be Microsoft, literally asking to be regulated. Which in the past you would say, I don't want regulation because I want freedom to do whatever I want. But they're realizing that they don't have all the answers and they need a conversation, a dialogue with government entities because they realize that if they're not involved in that policy making, if they're not involved in being governed um, and being regulated, that people who don't know what they're talking about, don't know what they're doing, can make very dangerous decisions. In other words, limiting decisions that in some cases can enable um, good and bad things. And so what we're seeing now is that, you know, state-run technology cultures may not have the same ethics that another state has. And so what's legal over there and the acceptance of hacking or the acceptance of looking at your citizen data and really acting on that in an anonymous way or maybe a non-anonymous way um, will change the impact and change the overall momentum through transformation as a whole. So yes, there are some technology things. Yes, I, I don't truly believe that we live in an AI world yet. We have we are kind of artificially smart, not necessarily intelligent. And we're very smart in very niche, small, narrow windows. You know, like the machine that can win AlphaGo can actually, you know, not cook for me, right? It was designed to just to play that game. Um, it cannot figure out how to pick up my kid from swimming. It, it just wasn't designed for that. Um, you know, we all know the digital assistants in our watches or in the kitchens or in the cars are, are very limited <laughs> as we ask them for things and they say, I don't know, or did you mean this? It's like, no, I did not. Um, so there are some technology limitations. There are some policy things. Uh, and as a whole, I think um, even just humans being humans is a factor as well. That's great, thank you. Um, David, are there any other questions? I'm asking my colleague because he has access to the chat box. Um, yes, there is another one. Uh, it says, uh, you have just mentioned the policy regulation and concerning that topic, how do the authorities say, stay up to date in terms of technology? Yeah. Um, so governmental entities uh, tend, well, governmental entities are, are pretty broad. So you can go into education, healthcare, military, government, pure government, um, judicial. I mean, it's a very broad topic. Um, they, what's interesting about them is much like the nonprofit sector, because government in a lot of ways is nonprofit in the same way, just like the arts, for example. Um, the desire to be technology savvy and on the leading edge is there the ability to do that is limited uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, every now and then there are massive grants and uh, you know big initiatives that transform cities into smart cities and, and all that. Um, but uh, you know, they, they oftentimes don't have enough money and time and you know they're regulated as well. And maybe you have to have votes from the public and those kinds of things that slow things down. But that doesn't mean that they're not aware. Um, so they hire consultants like like us uh, and, and and others as well. Um, they attend industry uh, conferences where people present the latest greatest. Generally speaking, we can all assume the military is fairly savvy, uh, but that doesn't mean the entire military is very savvy. Sometimes you get all the way down to the the field and there's no cell coverage, um, which is a little bit of a shock in some cases because now their entire smart system that they built that worked really well in Seattle, Washington. Uh, doesn't work at all in the desert. Uh, so there's little hiccups like that that happen all the time. Uh, but yeah, they, they attend conferences, they um, hire consultants, sometimes they have a chief technology officer of their own. There are a number of cities and municipalities with chief technology officers and chief digital officers. Um, I think that's fantastic. That's a step in the right direction. Not every city and municipality can afford that. Um, and overall, though, I think that what we're finding, at least in the United States, and I see that in Europe as well, I don't know really about Asia as much, although we do operate there, is a number of sharing across um, the, the, the municipality or in our world, the state level, the governors in the United States talking to each other about what they're doing, um, you know, Congress and, and whatnot. Um, 
you know, at the same time, I think the other thing going back to humans being humans is that most politicians, and this general stereotype, are in the older generation. Um, so they do funny things like they're using their iPhone in an odd way or an insecure way, and they don't fully realize it, right? Uh, whereas the young savvy politicians, and young doesn't necessarily mean digital savvy either, to be clear, um, are using social media and you know maybe using some collaborative systems other than email, tweeting all the time or um, using Slack or Teams or something like that. So uh, yeah, they. I mean, there's a number of ways they keep track. Um, they're not nearly they get a bad they have a bad rap um you know they get probably unfair criticism um but overall they are uh, they're trying just like any kind of corporate entity they're trying as well so hopefully they answer that great thank you um davide are there any other questions um yes i actually have a question um do you think that digital transformation is also driven from uh, not only the business user, but the entire population in, it, in its uh, broader concept and uh, keeping into consideration different um, stakeholders and different types of, um, let's say, audiences over there? How do mm -hmm. you think it's how do you think it's difficult to change a mindset here? So it's like moving from a more let's say between uh, Mark's uh, a paper-based society to a digital society? Yeah, so this is this is an interesting question um, because, you know, I live in a very connected city. Seattle, Washington is very, very connected with, you know, Expedia, Microsoft, Nordstrom, Amazon, HBO Digital, you know, they're all here in Seattle, for example. Um, and being connected, being in today's world in that way is both great, but it's also burdensome, meaning we have a legacy system in place. So, for example, we have all these roads, you know, for cars. Do we really want all these cars? And then if we ever have flying cars, what are we doing with the roads? <laughs> what do we need roads for? Um, a good example is you know, the first world, let's say United States versus some country in Africa, let's say Kenya. Kenya is a great example where we have a very regulated, very large banking system, Europe and North America and other areas, of course, but we have banks. However, people in Kenya didn't have the access to banks, the masses. And what they ended up doing is creating a peer-to-peer -peer payment system based on mobile phone networks. Uh, I think it's called M-Pesa. Um, in a lot of ways, that leapfrogged our banking system. So through the needs of the people, human-centric, using the technology that they had, which is just cell phone networks, they were able to pay each other using cell minutes and cell accounts as a way of currency. We now eventually have gotten to that point I mean, Apple just recently, you're able to pay someone through an iMessage, and they're not the first by any means because they're a quick follower or even slow follower in some cases, but you had PayPal or Venmo or any number of systems. Um, we just recently got that in, in the Western world, but they've had that forever. Um, you know, I would say six, seven, eight, nine years in, in Kenya, maybe longer. Um, so I think, you know, transformation comes in many different angles, and, and I think innovation. Um, is interesting. So innovation in a lot of ways does not mean invention. Those are, those are very distinctly different worlds. Um, and so without getting into the invention side, innovation oftentimes is about breaking something down, putting it back together in a way that performs better, that, that provides experiences and outcomes that people didn't really fully appreciate or weren't there before. And therefore it's, it's inspired. You get inspired by the natural ecosystem in nature, you apply that same pattern in the digital or physical world, and all of a sudden you have a whole new outcome of like hydraulic systems based on the anatomy of a leaf, or uh, airplane flaps that were truly inspired by the way that birds' wings fly and flex, as an example. So that's innovative. Um, maybe not inventive, the wing was already there, all you did was twist the wing up, 
or add another flap down or allow more flex in the wing or fold the wing just like a bird does. Uh, so, you know, very, very interesting things that can transform sustainability, uh, that can sustain an airline's profitability or increase the profitability of, you know, less fuel, more people. Um, you know, it comes from all over the place. So, you know, to answer the question, yes, um, transformation comes from all angles. It doesn't have to be centralized. You don't always have to know where you're going, which I think always goes back to the whole appreciation of agile and agile approaches as you're very iterative. You have an idea, you build a concept, you test it, you learn from it, you, you iterate again, you learn from it, you iterate again. Um, in our consumer world, you see that with your mobile apps all the time. You're constantly getting updates from your apps because they're testing user experiences, they're testing the data, they're learning from interactions, they're learning from what people are buying or not or how they're engaging or how they're not engaging and they're tweaking and they're iterating over and over and over again. And at some point though, to your point, most of what the ideas are probably gonna be is taking someone's other idea, standing on their shoulders and launching a brand new version of it that is disruptive or different in some way, shape or form, be it by service, be it by channel, um, be it by predictability and therefore profitability or relevance to the industry. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's where this comes from. That's great. Well, uh, very f next step to the, what you just said, I have very good, two good questions here. One is uh, asking about which sectors or industries do you see the most digital innovation taking place? Um, I think everyone's trying to use digital technologies to further their business outcomes, to engage their employees, to be more efficient from as a corporate entity or even just an NGO to engage the customers. I, I think it's basically mission-based and, and brand-based. You know, they're trying to figure out how to be more efficient, more effective in their investments across people and technology to achieve their mission. A bank's mission is to blah, blah, blah. You know, your company's mission is to blah, blah, blah. I think that's, that's really the key here. I think when you, what's interesting about it is when you find companies that have lost track of their mission and they think they're now technology companies, Think of it like a real estate agent company about 15 years ago. They had to spend a lot of money to maintain servers that manage their email. That is not why they got into business. They got into business to buy and sell homes for people. So that's why cloud-based email systems really took off. That's why none of you have servers in your home that run email like I used to have. We're all using Gmail or Outlook or something else. It's because that's not really why we're using email. We're using email to communicate. We're not using email to maintain servers. Um, and so, I think that's, you know, every single industry is doing that. Uh, I think in every single industry sector though, there are leaders and there are laggards and there are people in the middle and there are people in other industries that are actually looking to disrupt outside of their industry. I think that's the thing that we're finding now is that a bank is not a bank as much anymore because once you're a technology company, you're just a technology company. Is Uber a ride hailing platform? or is it a food delivery service, right? We don't really know at the moment. What is it able to do? It's basically a logistics company. I think UPS is a fantastic, or DHL, they're just logistics companies. They, they are shipping companies, absolutely. That's, that's how they've chosen to express their talent. Um, but, you know, what is Amazon? Amazon's delivering food, Amazon's delivering clothes, Amazon, you know, has planes now. The, um, they have these lockers. Those lockers are now rented to apartment buildings so that people can get their Amazon packages. Um, you know, I'm using very US centric things at the moment. I could use other things that are happening in Europe. But I guess my point is um, the industries are blurring a little bit through the digital platforms. And so everyone's innovating and everyone's looking for opportunities to disrupt versus being disrupted. Um, and I guess if you were to really kind of prioritize industries, you would probably go into your local region or country and what you may be known for. So the Northeast region, for example, is very financial services uh, focused and um, life sciences focused in, in the Northeast for us. And I would say that they're generally the most disruptive and, and innovative um, at the moment, but you could go down to you know, the Southwest of our country and find oil and gas being extremely innovative, trying to get off of oil and gas because essentially they're just an energy company and energy is in the sun and energy is in the wind. Energy is in fossil fuels as well. And that's what they were trying to leverage in the past. But they realized for their future, they need to go beyond that. 
So they're investing a ton of money in trying to figure out what their next new source of energy is, if it's batteries, if it's wind farms, what is it? Um, yep. Great, and I think the last questions, unless David, do you have others? No. So the last question was, okay, everyone is talking about AI and machine learning. What's the next big wave? Well, I think this wave's going to go for a while. <laughs> Probably. Um, you know, I, I think that we are, we, we believe, for example, in our, our trend lines, we call them Avanad trend lines, and you can look those up online. We do believe that we are in a world where AI is going to impact us. We, you know, we are an AI first world. We are in an intelligent era, the intelligence era, or, you know, every enterprise is trying to become an intelligent enterprise. And that's just me speaking from a, more of an enterprise lens at this moment. Um, and that is true. That's absolutely true. Uh, and your consumer world is already seeing it uh, with either you know, your Netflix queue or um, your maps, Waze maps or Google maps or, you know, the directions. And all. That's a lot of intelligence or um, your streetlights that are watching traffic and trying to be much more effective for you to get their traffic. Um, you know, those kinds of things or your doctor using models to predict whether or not you should get that test or not. No, we live in this world today. It will absolutely um, impact our lives. Whether or not policy will accelerate it or policy rules or privacy rules or those kinds of things will um, be an obstacle, we don't really know. It's going to be fairly broad because there's intelligence in every industry and in every system now. Um, you know, um, Microsoft, for example, wants to put intelligence, some form of intelligence in every product it has, which it actually probably has already. Um, Outlook is already predictive as well uh, as an AI engine. LinkedIn has an AI engine, like those kinds of things. Um, but I think the next big wave, honestly, is is when digital truly meets the physical. And I I, I, I believe that to be um, when the, the notion of organics and inorganics tend to blend. And so I would say it's biology. I think once we get to that point, it's a whole different world. Um, it's an it's a ethical issue uh, by far. We've seen this before with cloning, and we continue to see it with cloning, and we see we, we see it with um, gene mapping and those kinds of things. But I think that's when it hits us bigger. I think that's a bigger wave, um, and it affects humanity you know, in a, in a different way. But you know, I think going back to AI though, it is it it is a large topic. It is going to be a journey. Um, you know, the models will get smarter, the AIs will get smarter. We have to figure out who's controlling who and who's talking to what and what kind of decisions we're making, where the human is involved or not involved. Um, do we want to truly be automated completely or do we want to have humans be a backup or be a guide or provide wisdom? I think that's the thing about humans is we have this sense of emotional intelligence and wisdom that these systems will not have for a very long time. So where do we fit? Uh, and humans are not going away, and the jobs are not going away. To be clear, I, that's not my, our perspective, and they're just changing. You know, we went from railroads and horse, we went from horses to railroads, and railroads to cars and you know planes, and everyone's fine. You know, some people got left behind, and some people just were adapted. Humans are very adaptable. So yeah, I think the next big wave is more around um, biology, uh, and not pure biology uh, per se, but the the blending of the uh, the physical and the the digital or the organic and inorganic. Great, and I think that was a great way to conclude today's uh, uh, webinar, Matt. Uh, um, I don't know if we will have other time for more for more questions, but I think uh, you really br brought it quite high and, and uh, feel that it's a good moment to probably conclude. Uh, this webinar will be available to everyone and the recording will be available on our website. Uh, all the teams, uh, if they didn't make it today, they will receive it and they will also be able to access the other webinars as well as all the criteria for the Avana D Digital Innovation Award. And if you really had some pressing questions and you didn't have had a chance to ask it today you will be able to to you to see matt uh, uh, and i hope also tina face to face in oslo so uh, i want to thank you both for joining today's webinar thank you everyone who who joined on the on the uh, online and uh, see you all in oslo